Okay, in today's lecture, uh, we're going to cover the first part of the section 5.5 material on alternating series. And uh, so far in chapter five, most of the series that we've been working with uh, are series where all of the terms were positive. Uh, that is, we're adding a bunch of positive numbers together and determining whether those, um, that series or that sum is approaching a finite value or diverging to infinity. Uh, so in this section, 5.5, we'll consider an alternating series. Uh, so let's start by defining it. An alternating series is any series uh, whose terms alternate in sign. Uh, so that would be a series which would have the following form, maybe the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the nth times a sub n. Uh, so in this case, our first term where n equals 1 uh, would give us a first term of the series which would be negative, or uh, something of the form the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times a sub n, uh, so in this case, the first term of that series, when n equals 1, uh, we would have a positive value. And we're assuming that this a sub n term, uh, so that is this expression that appears after that negative 1 raised to some power, is positive for all values of n. So any uh, alternating series is a series whose terms alternate in sign, and it can be expressed in one of these two forms. So as an example of an alternating series, uh, we could consider the following. Uh, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 divided by n. Uh, so if we plug in n equals 1, we have a positive 1. Uh, and then our next term when n equals 2 would be negative 1 half. And then a positive 1 third, negative 1 fourth, and so on. Uh, so for this alternating series, we ask, well, does it converge or diverge? Um, now, to answer the question of convergence or divergence for an alternating series, uh, we have a new test known as the alternating series test. And uh, the question before we introduce it is, well, when would you use this test uh, versus the other tests which, which we've uh, talked about so far in Chapter 5? And this one's pretty obvious. It's called the alternating series test. Uh, you're going to use this any time that you're working with an alternating series. Uh, so if your series has the form, uh, the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n uh, times a sub n, where a sub n is positive, uh, this series is guaranteed to converge if it satisfies uh, both of the following conditions. So for this alternating series test, there's two things we need to check. Uh, the first one is that the limit of this a sub n term, uh, that is the part that follows the negative one uh, raised to the nth power, uh, has to be zero. If this limit is anything other than zero, uh, that means that the series would diverge by the test for divergence. Uh, we know that we need this limit to be zero in order uh, for the series to have a chance to converge. And the second condition is that the sequence of terms a sub n is decreasing. Uh, so that is the n plus one term in our sequence is less than or equal to the nth term in that sequence. Uh, so let's see if we could try to illustrate why these two conditions would guarantee convergence for uh, an alternating series. Um, so let's suppose that we have an alternating series of the following form. Uh, the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 times b sub n, uh, where b sub n is some positive uh, value for all values of n. Uh, so deter to determine convergence or divergence of a series, uh, we consider the sequence of partial sums. Uh, so here, our first partial sum, uh, S sub 1, is just the first term in this series. Uh, so plugging in n equals 1 to this series, we just have B1. Uh, so then the second partial sum would be the sum of the first two terms, 
And since it's alternating in sign, uh, we have a positive B1 and then minus B2. Uh, then our third partial sum uh, is the sum of the first three terms. And since it's alternating, we have B1 minus B2 plus B3. And then for our fourth partial sum, we've got the sum of the first four terms, which are all alternating, and so on. Uh, so let's illustrate that uh, this sequence of partial sums will converge uh, to a sum uh, under the conditions uh, set in place by the alternating series test. Um, so here along a number line, uh, let's take some number line which is going to be used to denote uh, the values of our uh, sequence of partial sums. So we're starting at zero. We don't currently have anything that we're adding. Now the first term in that sequence of partial sums, this S sub one, is a positive B one. So from zero, we're going to move a distance of B one units to the right. And that is our first partial sum. Uh, now the second term in our sequence of partial sums, S two, is B one and then minus B two. So from this value that I had of B one, uh, we're adding a negative B two. So we're going to move in the negative direction, a distance of B two units to get my second uh, term in the sequence of partial sums. Now for my third term in that sequence of partial sums, we have B1 minus B2 and then plus B3. So from that second partial sum, we are adding B3. Uh, and these distances that we're moving back and forth to the left and right uh, are decreasing um, as long as this second condition for the alternating series test is being met. As long as the sequence A sub N is decreasing, uh, then the distances that we're moving back and forth to the left and right are getting smaller. Uh, so if we keep adding these terms, we would have a negative B4, then a positive B5, a negative B6, and so on. Uh, so our sequence of partial sums started at S1, then S2, then S3, S4, S5, S6, and so on. Uh, so our sequence of partial sums, since B sub n is decreasing, or as long as B sub n is decreasing, uh, is starting to close in on some value S, and we know that we will reach uh, some value S as long as uh, B sub n approaches zero. That is, if the successive steps are becoming smaller and converging to some value. Uh, so that is this first condition in the alternating series test. We need the limit of uh, those A sub n terms, or uh, down here I was using B sub n, uh, to be zero in order for that sequence to converge. Um, so now that we have this test for convergence of alternating series, let's look at some examples. Uh, in this next example, we're asked to determine if the following series converges or diverges. And we can see that it is a alternating series. Um, so to use the alternating series test, I want to identify what is A sub N. Uh, what is the term that appears after negative one raised to some power? Uh, so here we had negative one to the nth uh, divided by the square root of n plus one. So a sub n is going to be one over the square root of n plus one. Uh, we just neglect that alternating term, the negative one to some power. Uh, we don't have to consider for that test. Uh, so now for the alternating series test, there's two things that we have to check. Uh, the first condition is that the limit of A sub N as N approaches infinity has to be zero. So here we're looking at the limit as N approaches infinity of one over the square root of N plus one. And we see as N becomes larger, uh, we get one divided by larger numbers, and this ratio is approaching zero. So the first condition for the alternating series test is satisfied.
And the second thing that we have to check is whether the sequence A sub n is decreasing. Uh, to, so to show that a sequence is decreasing, well, we need to show that the n plus first term is less than the nth term. So let's consider A sub n plus 1. So here, replacing n with n plus 1, we would have 1 over the square root of n plus 2, which I know is less than 1 over the square root of n plus 1. 1. That is, if I divide by a larger number, I get something less than if it was just the n plus 1. Uh, but this term is our expression for a sub n. Uh, so here I have shown that a sub n plus 1 is less than a sub n. Uh, so the sequence uh, of a sub n terms is decreasing, which uh, was the second condition we needed for convergence. Uh, so since both of these conditions are satisfied, uh, we can say the series converges by the alternating series test. So here, this series is convergent. So let's look at some other ones, uh, maybe slightly more difficult. So in part B, uh, we have uh, a series which is not yet written using the sigma notation. Uh, it's given as 1 over log 2 minus 1 over log 3 plus 1 over log 4 and so on. Uh, so let's first write this series using sigma notation. So here, if our series is starting at n equals 1, and I want the first term of my series to be a positive value, uh, then I'm going to use negative 1 to the n plus 1 power, so that when n is 1, uh, I get negative 1 squared, so that that first term is positive. Uh, now we can see that our numerator is always either plus or minus 1, so we have this alternating uh, sign captured in the numerator. And the general pattern in our denominator appears to be uh, the natural log of uh, n plus 1. Uh, why not just natural log of n? Well, if I want this series to start at n equals 1, uh, then we have uh, the first term we need to be natural log of 2. Uh, so we're using the n plus 1 here instead of just log n for our denominator. Um, or if we wanted, uh, we could also have this series start at 2, in which case we would have negative 1 to the nth power over the natural log of n. So that's another way that we could write this. Uh, so let's determine if this series is going to converge or diverge. We see it's, uh, of course, an alternating series. Uh, so to apply the alternating series test, we have to determine what a sub n is. Uh, so in this case, uh, I could take a sub n to be uh, 1 over the natural log of n plus 1. And there's two things that we need uh, to determine for convergence here. Uh, the first thing is whether this limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to 0. Uh, now here, we know that uh, the natural logarithm is an increasing function, so as n gets larger, my denominator is getting larger, uh, and taking 1 over larger uh, and larger numbers, I get a ratio which is approaching 0. So it satisfies the first condition. Uh, now, the second condition is that the sequence of a sub n terms is decreasing. So if we look at a sub n plus 1, we would have 1 over the natural log of n plus 2, uh, which we know is less than 1 over the natural log of n plus 1, since the natural log is an increasing function. Uh, so the denominator in this first term is less than, uh, excuse me, is greater than the denominator of the second term. Therefore, uh, 1 over that value is less than 1 over uh, log of n plus 1. 
but this was the expression for a sub n, so we've shown that a sub n is a decreasing sequence. Um, so since both uh, of these conditions are satisfied, we can say the series converges by the alternating series test. So here we had convergence. Uh, so let's look at another one. In our next example, part C, we have the sum from 1 to infinity of uh, negative 1 uh, times 2n squared over 5n squared plus 1. Uh, so we see that it is an alternating series. And in this example, our term a sub n, if we ignore the uh, alternating sign, is uh, given by 2n squared over 5n squared plus 1. Uh, so for the alternating series test, there's two things that we need to check. Uh, the first one is whether the limit of this a sub n term is zero. So here a sub n was 2n squared over 5n squared plus 1. And here we have the infinite limit of a rational function where we have the same highest power of n on top and bottom. Uh, so for these infinite limits of rational functions where we have the same highest power, our limit is given by the ratio of those lead coefficients. Uh, in this example, 2 fifths, which is not equal to zero. So recall, if the limit of the general term of our uh, series is anything other than zero, uh, we know that this series will have to diverge by the test for divergence. So from our first condition here, uh, we can say that the series diverges by the uh, test for divergence. All right, so that first condition for the alternating series test was not met. Uh, if we have anything other than a zero limit, we know the test for divergence says that our series is uh, divergent. So let's look at um, our next example. In part D, uh, we have the sum from one to infinity of negative one to the n minus one over three to the nth power. So this is uh, an alternating series, and we need to identify our general a sub n term. Uh, so in this example, we're going to take a sub n uh, to be 1 over 3 to the nth power. And we need to check our two conditions uh, for uh, the alternating series test. The first one is that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which is 1 over 3 to the n, or if we prefer, uh, we could rewrite this as uh, 1 third raised to the nth power. Uh, so as n gets larger, uh, we see we have 1 over a denominator, which is getting larger and larger. Uh, so this ratio is approaching 0. Now, the second condition that we have for the alternating series test is that a sub n uh, must be a decreasing sequence. And to show that it is, uh, we would look at the a sub n plus 1 term, and we need to show it's less than a sub n. Uh, so here, a sub n plus 1 would be given by 1 over 3 to the n plus 1 power, which I could rewrite as 1 over 3 times 3 to the nth power. So if I split up that exponent n plus 1, I can rewrite it as 3 to the first times 3 to the nth, uh, which is the same as 1 third of 1 over 3 to the nth power. So of course this is less than 1 over 3 
to the nth, since we were taking a third of that value, uh, so it's less than just one over three to the n by itself, uh, but this term is a sub n. Uh, so here we have shown that a sub n plus one is less than a sub n, which means that a sub n is a decreasing sequence. Uh, so since both of these conditions are satisfied, uh, we can say the series converges by the alternating series test. So here we have our series is converging. All right. Um, so let's look at some other ones. In this next one, part E, uh, we have the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the nth uh, times 2 to the 4 over n power. Uh, so right away, because of this negative 1 to the nth, we recognize it as an alternating series. And to apply the alternating series test, we're going to choose a sub n, which in this case is 2 raised to the 4 over n power. And there's two things that we have to check for convergence um, for an alternating series. Uh, the first is whether the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, which is 2 to the 4 over n power, is equal to 0. Uh, now here, as n approaches infinity, this exponent 4 over n is approaching 0. So we get something that is approaching 2 to the 0 power, uh, which would be 1. So we see that this limit is non-zero. Uh, so recall if the limit of our general term a sub n as n approaches infinity is anything other than zero, uh, this series diverges by the test for divergence. So here the series diverges by the test for divergence. All right. So let's look at some other ones. Uh, in part F, we have the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 power uh, times log n over n. So again, uh, we see that it is clearly an alternating series. So to apply the alternating series test, uh, we need to identify what is a sub n. Uh, in this example, we have natural log of n divided by n. And there's two things that we have to test for the alternating series test. The first condition is that the limit as n approaches infinity of our a sub n term, which was log n over n, uh, has to be zero. Now here, uh, as n gets larger, we have uh, a numerator and denominator, which are, are both approaching infinity. Uh, so we have an indeterminate limit of the form infinity over infinity, and so we can apply L'Hopital's rule, which says, that the limit as n uh, approaches infinity of this ratio is the same as the limit of the ratio of the derivatives. So here, uh, our derivative of the numerator, natural log of n, is 1 over n. Uh, we're dividing by the derivative of n, uh, which is 1. Uh, so we have just the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n, which is indeed 0. Now, the second condition uh, for the alternating series test is that this uh, sequence a sub n must be decreasing. Now here, uh, if we try to approach this the same way that we have been, let's look at the a sub n plus one term. Well, if we write it out, we have the natural log of n plus one divided by n plus one. And it's not immediately clear uh, that this term would be less than uh, the natural log of n over n. Um, so here, we could maybe 
write it like this. Uh, the question is whether the inequality holds. Uh, is this less than natural log of n over n, which is a sub n? So in order to uh, show that a sequence is decreasing, either we could compare the n plus 1 and n terms directly, uh, which is a little tough to do here, uh, or another way that we could show a sequence or a function is decreasing is by looking at its derivative and showing that it's negative. Uh, so here, let's consider taking the derivative with respect to n of uh, a sub n. So to differentiate this a sub n function, uh, we've got to make use of the quotient rule. And the quotient rule says we start by taking the derivative of our numerator. So derivative of log n is 1 over n times our denominator, n. And then we subtract the numerator, which is the natural log of n, times the derivative of the denominator, which would be 1. So here, just minus the natural log of n. And then the whole thing is divided by our denominator, uh, which was n squared. So simplifying a little bit, we have uh, 1 minus the natural log of n all over n squared. So in order for this to be decreasing, uh, we want to know whether this derivative is negative. And since our denominator is n squared, uh, which is always positive, the only way this quotient could be negative is if 1 minus the natural log of n is negative. So solving for n, uh, we have 1 has to be less than log of n. And then exponentiating, we would have e to the first has to be less than n. So as long as n is eventually greater than e, uh, which is 2.718, so on, uh, then we know uh, this sequence is decreasing. Uh, now here, our range of values for the series was from n equals 1 to infinity, so eventually n will be greater than e. Uh, so this second condition is met. Um, let's write it down here. We can say so the sequence of terms a sub n is eventually decreasing. So since both conditions are satisfied, uh, we can say the series converges by the alternating series test. Okay. Uh, so the next thing that we'll talk about in this section is a remainder estimate for alternating series. Uh, so let's recall back from um, our section 5.3 three on the integral test, uh, we mentioned that if we have a series with all positive terms, which converges, we can use the nth partial sum as an approximation of the sum of our series. And we had uh, an expression uh, for the remainder of the nth partial sum approximation to uh, the sum of the series. And we had a, a remainder estimate for the integral test, uh, which told us how far off our nth partial sum approximation was. Uh, but that was uh, relying on the fact that our series only had positive terms. So what about in the case of an alternating series? Um, so we have a similar result, uh, which is known as the remainder estimate for alternating series. Uh, so let's suppose that we have the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n uh, times a sub n, where a sub n is positive. And we know that this is a convergent alternating series with sum of s. Uh, and 
the nth partial sum, which is s sub n, would be the sum from 1 to n of negative 1 to the i a sub i. That is the sum of the first n terms in that series. So if we use that to approximate the true value of the sum, uh, we would define the remainder of that approximation as r sub n, and it would be the difference in the true value of the sum s and the nth partial sum approximation. So this remainder estimate for alternating series says that the absolute value of this r sub n expression uh, would be bounded above by a sub n plus 1. Uh, that is the positive value of the next term in our uh, series. Uh, so this absolute value of the remainder is giving us the error in our nth partial sum approximation. If I take the absolute value of this remainder, the absolute value tells me what is the distance between the true value of the sum s and my nth partial sum approximation. It's how accurate I am. Uh, so let's look at uh, some examples making use of this remainder estimate. So in this first one, uh, we're asked to consider the alternating series, sum from 1 to infinity, of negative 1 to the n divided by n squared. Uh, so here, uh, in part A, we're asked to prove that this series is convergent. So since it's an alternating series, uh, we want to use the alternating series test. So our first step is to identify what is A sub n. Uh, in this example, we have 1 over n squared, and we're going to check our two conditions for the alternating series test. The first one is the limit as n approaches infinity of our general term, 1 over n squared, uh, is indeed 0. If we have 1 divided by larger numbers, uh, the ratio is shrinking to 0. And then in uh, the second part, our second condition, we need to show uh, that this is a decreasing sequence. Uh, so a few ways we could do this. Uh, one way is to look at a sub n plus 1, uh, which would be given by 1 over n plus 1 squared. And we know that this would be less than 1 over n squared. So if I'm dividing by a larger number, say n plus 1 squared, I get something smaller than if it was just 1 over n squared. Uh, but this was the expression for a sub n. So we see that uh, this sequence is decreasing. So it meets both conditions. Uh, and we can say then that the series converges. by the alternating series test. All right, so we've shown that this series is convergent. Uh, so its sum uh, would be some number capital S. Uh, now, if we want to approximate that sum, uh, we could use a partial sum. So in the next part of uh, this problem, part B, we're told to use S6 to approximate the sum of the series and use the remainder estimate uh, to estimate the error, that is the absolute value in the uh, value of R6, the uh, remainder for the sixth partial sum approximation. So here, let's take a look at it. Um, Let's use capital S to denote the sum of this series, um, which was the series negative 1 to the n over n squared from uh, 1 to infinity. Um, so this sum, S, can be approximated by the sixth partial sum which would just be the sum of the first six terms of this series. Uh, so let's add our first six terms. Starting with the first term, when n is equal to 1, we have negative 1. Uh, then when n is equal to 2, we have a positive 1 divided by 2 squared, uh, so positive 1 fourth. Uh, 
then our next term, since this is alternating, will be negative. When we're plugging in 3, we have a negative 1 over 3 squared, which is 9, and then plus 1 over 4 squared, which would be 16, minus 1 over 5 squared, and then plus 1 over 6 squared, which is 36. So we stop when we hit that n equals 6 term. Uh, so this expression would be an approximation for the value of the sum. And uh, we're asked to determine, well, how accurate is that approximation to the true value of our sum? Uh, so let's look at the error. The error in our approximation is the absolute value of our remainder, R6. Uh, and we know from the remainder estimate for alternating series, this is bounded above by A sub n plus 1. Uh, now in this example, um, R, or excuse me, n is equal to 6. So if n is equal to 6, we have a 7 here. Uh, so the seventh term of our series is going to be 1 over 7 squared, or 1 over 49. So this um, nth partial sum, uh, or sixth partial sum approximation, is within 1 over 49 of the true value of the sum of our series. We know that's the largest value uh, that we could have for our error. Now, in the next part of this example, uh, let's say that we need to approximate the sum of our series uh, with an error less than 1 one hundredth, so maybe accuracy to within two decimal places. Uh, and we need to know, well, how many terms of our series do we need to add in order to accomplish that? Uh, so to answer that question, um, let's uh, uh, make use of that remainder estimate. Um, so here, we could say by the remainder estimate uh, for alternating series, we know that the error in an nth partial sum approximation, which would be the absolute value of r sub n, is uh, less than or equal to a sub n plus 1, which for this problem is 1 over n plus 1 squared. So for the desired accuracy, we're going to take this maximum value that we had for the error, which was 1 over n plus 1 quantity squared, and make sure that it's less than uh, the error bound that we were given. Now, in this example, uh, we needed an error of less than 1 one hundredth. So setting the maximum possible error less than 1 one hundredth, uh, we know that we would have the guaranteed accuracy. Um, so now let's solve this inequality for n. Uh, if we cross multiply here, we would have 100 has to be less than n plus 1 squared. Uh, so taking the square root of both sides, we have uh, 10 has to be less than n plus 1. Uh, so n would have to be strictly greater than 9. So the first integer value for n, which is greater than 9, uh, would be 10. So we need the sum of at least the first 10 terms in order to have accuracy within uh, 1 one hundredth of the true value for our sum. Okay. Uh, so let's look at another one. Uh, in this next part, uh, we have the following alternating series, the sum from 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the nth, uh, times n over 4 to the nth power. 
Um, so here, uh, in part A, we are asked to determine the minimum value of n that will ensure the error in the nth partial sum approximation is less than uh, two one thousandths. Uh, so here, let's introduce a little notation. Um, our expression for a sub n for this alternating series is n over four to the nth power. Um, so let's see uh, if we could determine the minimum number of terms we need to add to approximate the sum of the series within the given error bound. Um, so here we know that the error in an nth partial sum approximation for an alternating series uh, would be the absolute value of the remainder, r sub n, and by the remainder estimate, this is bounded above by a sub n plus one, uh, which for our example is n plus one over four to the n plus one power. So to ensure the desired accuracy, uh, we need this maximum value for the error to be less than uh, my two one thousandths. Where does that two one thousandths come from? Well, that is given in the problem statement. We need our error to be less than uh, 0.002, which is two one thousandths. Um, so uh, let's see if we can find the smallest value of n that would satisfy this. Uh, so here, um, let's simplify a little bit. We have n plus one over four to the n plus one power uh, would have to be less than uh, two over 1,000 or one over 500. Uh, now we can simplify a bit further. Uh, so we would have n plus one uh, over my four to the n plus one power I could rewrite as four to the first times four to the nth, which has to be less than uh, one over 500. Um, so if I take this factor of four and multiply across, I have n plus one over four to the n power uh, has to be uh, less than four over 500, or dividing through by four, uh, we would have one over 125. Um, so let's take a look at this. We uh, could simplify a little bit further here uh, to make this easier to check. Um, we would have, if I cross multiply, uh, 125 times n plus one, I would have to be less than four to the nth power. Uh, now this inequality cannot be solved analytically for n, uh, so I can't ever uh, simplify this to get n uh, uh, by itself. Uh, so if we can't solve for n, we could start testing values of n uh, to see which is the smallest value that would satisfy this. Uh, so if we started with n equals one, uh, we could check if this is true. So if n equals one, uh, we would have 125 times two, or 250, uh, and that would not be less than four to the first power. So this does not work. So we could try our next value of n. If n were equal to two, uh, we would have 125 times three, uh, and we would ask, is that less than four squared or 16? We can see pretty quickly that that would not be true. And then we would keep testing values of n, and the first value of n that we find, which would satisfy this inequality, is n equals five. Uh, we would have 125 times six uh, would be less than four to the fifth power. Um, so we can uh, see that this is the first value for which uh, this would be satisfied. Um, so uh, we need 
the sum of at least the first five terms of this series in order to estimate the true value of the sum uh, to within two one thousandths or one five hundredth. Uh, so in part B, uh, we are told, well, approximate the sum of our series to within an accuracy of two one thousandths. Um, so uh, we just found by part A that we could approximate the sum of this series, which was the sum from 1 to infinity of uh, negative 1 to the n times n over 4 to the n uh, by using a fifth partial sum uh, approximation or more terms. Um, so minimum, we need the first five terms, so let's see what they are. Uh, if we start by plugging in n equals 1, uh, we have a negative 1 over 4. Plus our next term, when n is equal to 2, we have a positive 2 over 4 squared, or 2 over 16. Uh, minus the next term, we would have a 3 over 4 cubed. Then plus uh, 4 over 4 to the 4th, or 1 over 4 cubed, minus 5 over 4 to the 5th power. Uh, so this expression would be an approximate value of uh, the true value for the sum of this series uh, to within 1 uh, 500th or uh, 2 1 thousandths. So we see that we can also use these nth partial sum approximations, uh, not just for series with um, all positive terms, uh, but for these alternating series as well. And we have a way to estimate how accurate uh, a given uh, partial sum approximation is or how many terms we need uh, to achieve uh, an approximate value for the sum within uh, a given accuracy. Uh, now, in the last part of this section, uh, we're going to talk about something uh, called absolute or conditional convergence, uh, and we'll save that for the second part of